So, folks, um, thank you for being willing to uh, sacrifice yet another uh, sort of half an hour to to the, the sort of capping piece, um, possibly something that we should have done earlier, um, uh, and that is to examine the issue of intent, uh, you know, kind of a little bit more thoroughly than what we did in the first uh, 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 webinar of this uh, of the series. Um, it should be apparent to you now that that's the journey, uh, except that uh, it doesn't end all the way back at the beginning. It, st it stops at, at, at number eight. Um, uh, and uh, let me remind you why it is that we, uh, we actually have these two perspectives on the same phenomenon. The phenomenon we're trying to kind of create a language for and produce a map for is this, this indescribable vastness, which is the reality behind our eyes. The, the, uh, it's, it's a compass for the inward, if you like. And we've had two kind of uh, sort of uh, kinds of compasses. The one looks at the issue uh, of how that nat the nature of that inward experience changes over time as, uh, as intention, and the other one is attention. We've given quite a lot of attention to attention, haha. -ha. Uh, we're going to look at just how the attention model fits into what we already understand about intention. Um, <clears throat> now, the, as, you, as you're familiar with, we said if you look at attention from the point of view of intent um, then then basically the journey of maturation is an incremental move from birth to death and what's true about birth is that you're here to get unconditionally and when you die you give everything unconditionally um, uh, and uh, 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 what we also said is that that actually what changes as you mature is an incremental shift. So you're talking about various shades of gray, uh, absolute darkness I'm here to get, and then it gets lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter until I'm here to give unconditionally. And that basically means that if you, if you cut this process in the middle, there's a place where kind of 51% darkness flips into 51% light uh, in the shade. Um, anything prior to that point you can call fundamentally immature, anything beyond that point you can call fundamentally mature. And you can see what we're doing is that we're basically doing a, a meaning equivalent of the shade. So fundamentally, what the person, an immature person is saying is, I am here to get. And fundamentally, what a mature person is saying is, I am here to give. Hmm. Now, if we look at this thing of proportionality, then it does suggest that as you, you can also then cut immature into finer gradations, um, you know, up to say 20, 25% light, 50% light, 75% uh, light. And then when you, so, so, so you can easily cut it into four. And then the, this, the meaning equivalence of those various shadings will be the following. The first intent would say quite unconditionally, I'm here to get. The second intent would say, I give to get. The third intent would say, I get to give. In other words, the point is giving, but I need to get something to give. And the fourth intent would be, I'm here to give. Um, uh, and, and what I'm going to describe is how that journey works over time. Um, uh, you know, why is it, how is it that we move from the first intent to the second intent to the third intent and to the fourth intent? Um, and what I'm also going to do is I'm going to take these two transition points. So the transition point between the first and the second intent, this transition point over here, and this transition point between the third and the fourth intent, I'm going to, in a sense, stretch them into a range. So basically, as we talk through the model, I'm going to describe this model, um, both in terms of what we call the four intentions or the four intents, and the six aspirations. Now, the six aspirations I've actually written up in my book, Intent. Uh, 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 um, it's just, it's usefulness. The usefulness of the model is just so that we can get a reasonably nuanced, finer tuned understanding of how intent matures. So, 
the first intent, um, you know, the, the, that statement I'm here to get, that's st that, that statement is most true for an infant at birth. Um, you know, at birth, the infant, the, the, the attitude isn't, you know, um, you know, um, you know, it's very uncomfortable. I mean, do you mind? I mean, do you, you know, um, uh, have you got to go to work tomorrow? I mean, the whole is you will make me happy now. And if you don't make me ha happy now, I will scream so loud. Uh, you know, the neighbors are going to think you're a bad parent and welfare will take me away. So any person who behaves from this point of view, I'm here to get unconditionally, he really is behaving like an infant. And, and what's very important about this um, at start, the start, is that it's absolutely concerned with the purely metabolic. It's completely about the body. Um, so a, a very unflattering way of looking at this is that I, I don't think infants are very much more than a sort of a digestive tract with two eyes plonked on top. You know, I mean, because all that they do is ingest, digest, and uh, the other one. There isn't a jest to it, but you know what I mean. It is a jest. It's very funny. Ha ha. Um, so, um, the, 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 and, and you, the parent, your role is just the kind of the, the facilitator, if you like, of the, of the, of the, this, uh, this sort of pipeline. Uh, you know, you, you put in and then uh, when that's sort of finished, then you walk around the room and you burp the little creature. And, and, when, and when that's finished, then, you know, you sort of you do the bottom end of this and then it all starts at the beginning again. It's really distressing, you know, uh, this process of uh, kind of dealing with this, uh, this pipeline. The, um, the, so how intent actually moves, how we move from this intent to get is that at some point, the brazen demand to get gets resisted by the other. I mean, I don't care how good a parent you claim to be. At some point, you'll have to admit that, you know, one night little uh, 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 Ali woke you up one last time and you sort of stalked the crib and sort of stuck your face in his face and said to him, if you ever wake me up again at three o'clock in the morning, I'll brain you. So suddenly you realize, hold on, you know, I can't just take from these people, they get angry with me. I have to be nice to them to get out of what I want. I have to give to get. I mean, so that's the big picture. The big picture is that the other resists the demand of the self and that forces the self to move. Um, the, uh, but, but so, so the self begins to understand uh, basically that the other has the power to withhold the good auspices of the self. And because the other's got the power to withhold the good auspices of the self, the strategy of life changes is I've actually got to gain control over the other. This movement, though, is, is, is more subtle than what I've just described. So, so, um, uh, um, the, so, so the, the infants or the, the pre-crawlers' first apprehension that the other has got the power to withhold the good auspices of the self is, is greeted with the most you know, unbelievable rage. I mean, you cannot... The, 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 the infant just cannot believe that you could be so horrendous. You know, I mean, one, one has to have great sympathy for these, these poor parents in the supermarket with a squalling brat in the trolley. Uh, I mean, you want to kind of pinch the little bugger on the way past because he's just making his parents' life a misery because he's got to have that, whatever it is, you know, the crisps or the toy or whatever. You know, so, so the infant's first response to this withholding of what makes him happy is rage. It's outrage. They explode. And that's why we call the second phase, the phase, the second aspiration, the phase of, of emotion. And it's really, it's, it's the phase of young Napoleon. So this, this, this kind of, this, this uh, sense that I'm the emperor, you've all got to serve me and why aren't you serving me? Um, uh, and so, you know, in my experience, um, um, uh, my, the, my closest experience of this is with my own, with my own children, obviously, um, you know, the, uh, and uh, in fact, with my, with my firstborn son, Khalil, um, he, he entered this phase of his life, this sort of the terrible twos when I started my business. And it used to be very charming because I, you know, what I, what I used to do is, is um, I was in the habit of bringing him, uh, you know, a, a, a suite when I came, came back from work. Uh, primarily because he was actually one of the only sources of light in what is other, very, otherwise a very troubled life 
the time. So, and, and I would come home and he'd be already sort of waddling up to the car. And, uh, you know, by the time I got to the front of the house, uh, you know, I'd, I'd have him in my arm. There'd be chocolate all over him. There'd be chocolate all over me. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. It's kind of, and he thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But um, uh, uh, one day I had a, a nightmare of a day at work. And so I was coming home and I forgot the sweet, you see. So when I arrived at home, uh, I, as I got out the car, he took one look at my hands and he saw that I, I didn't have a sweets and he erupted in absolute rage. I mean, that, that I had the, the gall to forget his sweet. He threw himself on the ground and bellowed at the top of his lungs. It was actually quite intimidating. And so I realized, you know, I, I said, Ooh, be careful. You mustn't forget the sweet next time. And, and, um, so, so initially the parent gets intimidated by this outrage, you see, by this, 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 this uh, brat uh, sort of uh, being incensed that you, f you aren't doing what you're supposed to do, which is to make them happy. Um, the, that, so I had a few iterations of this experience with Khalil until one day I was driving back from work and I, I passed our local store. And I, as I drove past the store, I, I had two thoughts. The first thought, I mustn't forget the sweet. And then my second thought is, you know, this little bugger, I'm, I'm getting myself manipulated by a two-year-old. To hell with him. No more sweets. So I arrive home, and this time I'm kind of set for the, for the reaction. You see, I get out the car, and I, I sort of I fit a little bit more firmly than normal, and I've got to sort of set to my jaw. He comes waddling up, takes one look at me, and, and I think he kind of worked out there's trouble here. So, so um, he, he, he walked straight up to me and he kind of put his arms around my leg, gave me a squeeze and smiled and said, Daddy. <laughs> and you can see what he had worked out is that, um, you know, if I scream at this old guy today, tomorrow I don't get a sweet. If I want a sweet out of him tomorrow, I better be nice to him today. So this, 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 uh, this, this we move from this, this aspiration of emotion of kind of resisting kind of, of the outrage of, of, of Napoleon bec uh, uh, on, the, on the basis that the other sort of no longer tolerates this behavior, you see. And then we realize, that, hold on, I really do have to be nice to get out of what I want, which is what de delivers us to the, the third aspiration, which is really middle childhood through to adolescence. It starts off with middle childhood. With the, 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 um, the program is, is actually very simple because in middle childhood, the child realizes you have to be nice to them to get out of them what you want. So in middle childhood, children are not rebellious. I mean, unless they've been sort of damaged in some way and they kind of, you know, mostly middle children in middle childhood are, are, are actually quite acquiescent. You know, uh, there's, there's nothing more important than, than pleasing the parent and, and being in the parent's good books. So um, the, the, the program of life is, you know, you've got to be sweet to them. You've got to be nice to them because then they'll get out of, they'll, they'll do what you want, basically. So that's how we start off this, uh, this period in the early part of middle childhood. This aspiration that is called mind, because it really is even just the text I give to get, it indicates like almost like a little bit of a, like a manipulative sort of edge to this. And that manipulativeness matures. And it kind of it, it, it gets to its full stature um, on the thirteenth birthday. So, so your angel goes to bed on the night of the, so twelve, twelve years and three hundred and sixty-four days. It kind of like, you know, still good night, daddy. Good night, me. With very sweet, very sweet. <laughs> you know. That next day on the thirteenth birth, birthday, this creature emerges from the room, and you think. You know, who the hell are you and what on earth have you done with my child? Because suddenly, you know, this, your, your, your sweet, acquiescent um, uh, uh, angel has turned into this kind of hormone-charged uh, competition junkie that turns absolutely everything into a showdown. Because what has happened, you see, is in that intervening night, the devil got into their heads and basically whispered and said, listen... The problem is that you always want them to like you. You're always trying to be nice to get them to like you. And the issue is that if you're always nice, they stop taking you seriously. The issue isn't to be liked. The issue is to be seen to be important. The issue is to be significant. 
which is why the, the uh, adolescence is so concerned with competition. It's all about who's first, who's important, getting first, being first. So, so this, this, this sort of competitiveness then sets up a very conflicted experience of life. Because the problem with get, you getting, becoming first is that everybody else has to get second. So this is why um, we get so alienated in our adolescence, you know. And the, the, the logic of this gets visited on us towards the end of adolescence, where we start having, in a sense, a reasonably rational insight. And that rational insight is, listen, um, you know, the problem with always wanting to come first is they need to get come second. And the reason why I'm, I'm wanting to compete with them is that I actually want their admiration. So I'm competing with you because I want you to admire you. I want you to love me. I want you to think I'm special. But in order to compete, I mean, to, uh, to succeed, I have to win and you have to lose. So I, I want to get you to love me by making you lose. Now, what kind of logic is that? You know, um, uh, and so there's a deep contradiction. There's a terrible contradiction rooted in all competitive behavior. For me to win, I want you to love me, but for me to win, you have to lose. So in fact, rather than getting the admiration and the love, what I actually achieve is an incredible experience of alienation. Um, and, and, and that experience of alienation then is, forces me to sort of engage, uh, you know, a, a, a higher order of everything. You know, I can't just be here for myself. So then we are kind of introduced into the world of basically the adult, of having some kind of a community conscience. The beginning part of this uh, community consciousness, so this fourth aspiration, I mean, each, you, might have, you might have noticed that each one of these, these uh, aspirations have a beginning and have like an entrance and an exit part. The entrance of this is actually quite naive. Um, it is, it is, it is about this understanding that, you know, you know, you, you really do have to make the world a better place. So you remember when we spoke about, um, uh, uh, the, when we spoke about the intentions or, or rather the, the eight stations, we said that the move, the, 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 the move to meaning is what then creates this sort of move towards becoming an adult. And, and meaning is, I need to make some kind of a contribution with my life. So at this stage of people's lives, they, be, they, they take on big causes. They sort of take on the environment or they take on, um, you know, uh, violence to women or the education of the poor or some cause, some issue. And it's also, by the way, we're very vulnerable in this period and, and cynical people really exploit this. I mean, this is, if you think about the... Um, you know, the whole suicide bombing thing. I mean, it's, it's uh, the people who blow themselves up are very rarely older than 22. Um, you know, I mean, uh, it's old codgers in their 40s who get other people's children to go and blow themselves up. But the, uh, but the people who actually do the blowing up aren't, aren't old people. They're people in this kind of period in their lives because you have the sense that you need to do something dramatic to make the world a better place. This desire to make the world a better place also then starts to introduce you to this idea of, of kind of real connectedness and real love. And um, so we also then start taking on a greater and greater sense of responsibility, which then ends up with kind of full-blown adulthood uh, with, you know, three kids in the car and, um, and the mortgage and the stressed lifestyle and working very hard. And, but what's very important about this way of being is that it's not selfish. So if you confront somebody in this latter end of this kind of community phase who's really working very hard to kind of live up to their responsibilities, you say, you know, you, you're only going to work to earn a living. You say, no, but that's true, but I mean, I'm, just, I'm, I'm going there for money, but I'm, I'm getting money in order to give, which is why the broad description of that period of my intent is I get to give. I have to earn a living. I have to earn my dues in order to make a contribution. Towards the end of this, what, what normally happens is that, you know, the fellow wakes up, or the woman, but I mean, obviously I'm a man, so I can talk about my side of this kind of problem. Maybe 
between 45 and 55, I think this is where this happens to people. The, you know, you wake up one morning and you sort of swing your hairy legs over the bed and you try to take a look at your feet, but, you know, it's very difficult to look past your own stomach and the varicose veins on your legs. because, In fact, you become quite not sort of an unsightly kind of spectacle. You know, um, you can't remember when you and the spouse of yours have actually done anything together because you both found each other to become, have become a little bit kind of objectionable. You know, she's developed the most unbelievable halitosis. Oh my God, you can't believe it. And then you obviously start thinking, you know, and you, you reflect on this life of yours. And um, you think, you know, when I was young and I didn't look like this, they promised me, they said, you know, I, I'm, they told me I can't just be happy on my own. You know, uh, you know, I've got to, you know, I've got to earn my dues. I've got to, I've got to support it. I've got to live up to my duties. I've got to oh, make everybody else happy. Then I'll be happy. And I did that. I worked very hard to make everybody else happy. And I've ended up in the most alienated time in my life. You know, I mean, uh, these three children that I've done it for, I mean, the eldest is sitting in Papua New Guinea with a bone through his nose. The second eldest is the one I actually don't like at all. He's become an accountant. And the youngest is oscillating between the backyard where he's smoking dope and the, the, uh, the couch where he's watching TV. And he's been like that and he's now 26. So, so they told me I'd be happy if I did all of the sacrificing for the family. And in fact, I'm not. I'm deeply miserable. So, so we start to get this insight that, that, that the price that we paid for all of this service and success out there has been too high. And so we go through a period that we would call ascetic withdrawal, which is really going now to the latter stages of our, in, of our attention model. It's kind of like going on to the phase of meaning um, where uh, you, you really you, you get kind of cynical of the whole prospect of serving all of these people out there and um, kind of if you like earning your dues and um, uh, uh, this this so so uh, so you can if you look at it from a point of intent um, all of these are actually still putting the happiness in the future you know I'll be happy if I, if I full more on empty bowel if you like is what happiness is about and then I realize, hold on, no, if, I, if, I, if I don't get them to like me, then uh, I'm not going to get a full more in it. So I, I get them to like me, but actually, no, getting them to like is not good enough. I've actually, in order to get their admiration, I've got to dominate them, and then uh, I'll, they'll like me, and then I'll be happy. And then I realize, hold on, no, if I, if I dominate them, then I'm alienating them. I've actually got to cooperate with them. So, so what's happening at every step of the way is that the point of finally being happy gets pushed further and further away. There's a a further and further delay of gratification. And that eventually is taken to an ex extremity, which is what this ascetic withdrawal is about, where you become completely cynical of this idea that happiness is on the other side of the rainbow. Hmm. So the outcome of the fifth aspiration is a complete disavowal of conditional motive. So you can describe your intent from the first to the fifth as a further and further delay of gratification. And it's also the structure of your intent is I'm unhappy now I'll do stuff and then I'll be happy. So my motive is constructed as an emptiness as an unhappiness that seeks to be filled in the future. What happens beyond the fifth is a complete inversion where you know, you can't describe the person's intent as an emptiness that seeks to be filled, but a fullness that spontaneously empties. So in other words, you forego all conditional motive. Happiness is not about getting anywhere. You realize that happiness, you're sitting in it, and therefore you act. Now, how that mapping relates to the eight tensions is the following. The first attention is the station of the insignificant. This is the station of the infant. And as we said, the station of the infant is driven from the move, from the, the shift of, of, of attention from inward to outward. 
That shift of move from inward to outward produces a second station, which is the station of form. The station of form is, a, is basically a, a pinned, it's, it's, it's constituted of a move from gatheredness to separation. The, the crawler is trying to kind of individuate, he's sort of finding his own form, he's trying to separate. That then moves into the third station of middle childhood, which you call the station of the outward, which is a station of from, the, from insignificant to significant, not really being able to discern to becoming discerning. That then becomes like sort of real, the, the depth of adolescence separation. And that's from form to meaning. You remember we said that yesterday. That move from form to meaning then provides us our first uh, kind of inter introduction to being fully adult, the station of, of adults who are in charge of something. It's the, so the significant ones who both designate significance and are significant. And that station is, as you remember, we described, is typified by a move from the outward to the inward. And that then produces the next stage of meaning, which is, if you like, the um, kind of like the area of the uh, the fifth aspiration, starting of the fifth aspiration from separation to gatheredness. I no longer want to stand out and I want to go in. And that then goes to uh, the station of the inward, which we described as fanat, which is from the significant to insignificant, which then produces going on. So that's how these two maps relate to each other, how the two goods fit. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, that's it. Um, uh, I don't know if there are any um, questions with regard to this, but that's how the intent model and the attention model actually fit together. Hmm. I see it's taken a bit longer than... Um, uh, normal. So, um, the questions, I think we can, we can can it then. Thank folks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to exercise this with you. Uh, it would be interesting to know I'm assuming that's what you're saying. Anna, it'll be interesting to know, do the two models as a whole relate to each other? Yes, they do. And, and they, they relate to each other um, uh, as we indicated, uh, as, as what this, um, um, this, uh, th this graphic here demonstrates. Remember that you're looking at the same phenomenon. You're not looking at two different phenomena. Attention and intention on different phenomena. They're two different framings of the same phenomenon, which is actually vast, which is very difficult to give language to. But these are two different descriptions that look at the same thing that kind of describe it in slightly different terms or different terms. So Zuhayb, yes, uh, the maturation of intent and attention do progress at different paces. Uh, 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 f f with people that not everybody goes and also you could be you could tarry in some area of your life and suddenly be fast-tracked at another area of your life so um, these things aren't in fact a very good way of dealing with this model actually is if you if you um, if you have some free time Write down 33, do a biographic account in 33 statements of yourself, for yourself. And um, uh, I mean, do, do some thinking around this. You, you might want to write down 100 statements of, you know, what were the significant events that you had in your life that have made you who you are? Um, and then, then um, edit them down to 33, so 33 statements. And then go and take a rest, have a cup of coffee or whatever, or even then go back to the exercise the next day. What you can do on the next day is, um, is look at this model here and just track in the margin of where you've put these 33 statements, where you can remember, where you can see yourself shifting from the, either, the, either the intentions, the first intent, the second, the third intent, 
and the, the attentions. And you will find the points of transition in that journey. You, so this is useful to you in one way, in, 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 in two ways, sorry. First of all, you, can, you start seeing how the grid fits into your life. And you can start making sense out of the grid. You've got some datum points to make sense out of the grid. But secondly, you also get a sense of where you're at right now. And it gives you a little bit of a heads up of the kinds of things you're likely to be dealing with in the future. Uh, Amra, one doesn't always get to the to this fourth intent. I'm here to give unconditionally because because the 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 the, the, the to be here to give unconditionally means to be willing to forego outcomes unconditionally, and and that's in our culture today, not very many people actually achieve that. Or, or, or many people don't achieve that. Let me put it that way. Uh, you see, in, so Anna says, <laughs> in what way is the station of meaning correlated to getting? <sighs> you see, we have to come to terms with the fact well, let me put it, the phrase it as a question. Is there a difference between taking and receiving? And yes, there is a difference. Now, the problem with the word getting is that the word getting can actually hold both of those significances. Now, up until the phase of meaning, we're busy taking. Hmm? In the station of the significant, we're, we're taking, but it was benign intent. I mean, I'm taking money to feed my family. So I'm taking. From meaning onwards, we start to understand that we don't have to take anything from life. Life is designed to work. The moment you stop taking, you receive wildly in excess of what you would have wanted in the first place. So you do get in the sixth, seventh, and eighth aspiration. But the getting isn't your intent. You, you realize that you don't have to construct your intent around what you're getting because what you, you, you will receive much more than what you could ever uh, kind of uh, um, account for on the basis of your own ingenuity if you stop making that your problem. I mean, these last three stations, particularly the last two, are rooted in gratitude. So, if you think about your relationship with other people, other human beings, as a, a metaphor for your relationship with Allah and your relationship with existence, if you're dealing with somebody whose who's attitude is, you owe me, give me, you're going to respond by withholding. If you're dealing with somebody whose attitude is, I've paid you, therefore you owe me, uh, you're still going to resist that person. If you're dealing with somebody who's paying you, but you know that the reason why they're paying you is they're trying to create a sense of entitlement so they can get, that's still not a, but when you're dealing with somebody who genuinely is deeply grateful for everything that you've already given them, that person you'll give to in an unrestrained way. So that's the problem we're faced with in the last stages of our life, is that when you forego the thing that you want, you get it. You receive it because you're not taking it. Uh, would you say that there's a corresponding evolution of religiosity during the lifetime? Uh, is that um, so, Nick? I do think there's a corresponding uh, evolution of people's religiosity in their lifetime. So, generally the religion of the people of the fifth station uh, uh, sort of going on from the fourth to the fifth so so here is 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 really about it's about order and depending on the youth of the person it's also about willing to do really grand things in order to establish the order so so it's about uh, you know sort of wanting things to be right uh, a person with the sixth aspiration is kind of like 
a little bit like the indulgent grandparent who's, who's, who's kind of the, 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 the moral compass is maybe a little bit wobbly. And um, uh, the last stage is that you're, you're not that in, so much interested in being correct or right. Your, 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 spiritual, your, your religiosity is really concerned with creating the possibility of first-hand experience of the divine. Uh, Zuhaib, <laughs> no, no, you're very welcome to ask me where I'm at. And, and, and I'm very, um, it's obviously perfectly within my right to say to you, it's none of your bloody business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. Um, uh, it's been wonderful dealing with you with this. And uh, 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 you know, maybe we'll find something else to kind of entertain each other with over time. I don't know if you're still locked down in Pakistan, but uh, all the best. Uh, Assalamu alaikum.